or three. I just um, before we do so, I, I just wanted to add a little tribute to um, to Valerie Cromwell. Um, uh, I'm Paul Seaborn, I'm director of the History of Parliament Trust. Valerie was my predecessor um, up till 2001. I came across. I was I was rummaging through some old stuff um, yes, yesterday, and purely by accident came across a, a letter from Valerie in 1991. Um, remarking to me that, 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 that she had just taken on the poisoned chalice of running the History of Parliament <laughs> Trust. Um, but she must have done it very well because it didn't feel like a poisoned chalice when I, when I took over from her in, in 2001. It, it felt like a, a very different experience. But um, as, as people will remember, I think Harry was a, was a huge bundle of energy and, and, and a great character and, 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 and an interesting historian too. Um, I, I also should say that I, I, was, um, I was asked by the uh, President of the International Commission of the History of Representative and Parliamentary Institutions, which is an organisation that I always say needs a very much shorter name, um, to also say that, um, that it, um, it, it has enormous respect and uh, affection for, for Valerie, who was its Secretary General for, I can't remember now how many years, but a, a, a long time and, and, and did a lot to make that organisation. Uh, that, that definitely was a poison chalice and um, <laughs> I think as, as, as so many international organisations are. But anyway, we, uh, I, I remember very well and I'm, I'm very sorry that John King can't be here to, to, um, to I think, to listen to uh, the tributes that have been paid to her. Anyway, to business. Um, we have a, a great panel uh, now, um, which will go back to perhaps some of those stories that we about electoral violence and skullduggery and various daring do. Um, that, that perhaps we shouldn't talk about that much, but it's always fun to do so. Um, uh, we have three uh, great speakers. Uh, Elaine Chalice will will start. Elaine, as m most people probably know, is professor of British history at Liverpool and has done an enormous amount of work to, um, to illuminate uh, 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 the careers, the um, involvement of elite women in British political life, not just elite women, all women in British political life, about which she's going to talk. Um, Kerry Hutchison, who is a visiting fellow at the University of Durham and um, has been involved for a long time on its the um, electoral violence project in uh, Durham, which has done huge amounts to um, tell us about uh, what really went on in Victorian elections. And Naomi Lloyd Jones, um, now leading a career fellow at Durham, who's worked on Scottish nationalism in or is working, I should say, on Scottish nationalism in the late nineteenth, the early twentieth century and working currently on a, a, a Lever Hume project on, on the Liberal Caucus, which sounds absolutely fascinating. I know that Elaine has to go after, after she um, <coughs> speaks, so um, she said that um, if anybody has any uh, questions for her, she will certainly respond by, by email afterwards, but she, she really, she really needs, needs to whiz off, so that's, that's fine. Elaine, do you want to kick off? Do I need the... the um Microphone, or can you hear me? No, no, no. Can you use my video? Okay, let's, let's try. I'm usually pretty good at, at, at shouting. Um, <coughs> right. And my apologies for having to leave early, but I, I'm afraid I have to drive back and move the flight. And, and that's so, uh, in Somerset, it means I've got to go and get it right away. Okay, um, let's take a look at, at women's involvement in electoral politics and the culture of politics in, in the 18th century. This is just sort of a, a fast gallop. Five months before the general election of 1768, Lord Breadalbane complained to his daughter, Marchioness Grey, that the rage of electioneering had already infected Scotland and that the epidemical madness of the upcoming election was more virulent than ever. At the same time in London, Sarah Osborne was observing Riley that cards and elections are the only subjects. And Lady Spencer, writing from Altrup, was remarking, we are all election mad. As the polls approached, the subject of elections dominated elite society everywhere. Statements such as these form a refrain in the women's letters from London and the country during the election years in the second half of the 18th century. When elections swept, swept the country, they dominated conversations, personal correspondences, and the press. As national politicization was spurred by improvements in transportation and communication, 
and a steady stream of highly politicized events, the peaks of political excitement became ever higher and more encompassing. Particularly heated campaigns made the most impact and could generate interest well down the social scale. For the political elite, close family relationships and political connections created an intimacy that had long encouraged periodic outbursts of election-related <coughs> political excitement. For women who were members of the political elite, electoral politics were a fact of life. The familial and factional nature of politics not only ensured their political awareness and encouraged their interest, but the personal and social nature of the 18th century political world often required their active participation as well. Contested elections generated viral excitement, at least in part because they were participatory events. And I just want to say I'm co-investigator of the ECPEC project, so that's 18th century political participation in electoral culture, if you want to destroy the title for something. <laughs> and we've counted the number of elections. We've actually gone through and we've counted the number of elections that are between 1695 and 1832. There's over 11, 11 and a half thousand of them. And of those, 28%, a little bit over 28%, go right to the poll. So it's really a fairly high number if you think about it. And of those, if we take uh, Franco Gorman's comment that up to three quarters of all elections were contested at least partially, that suggests that we have over 9,000 elections in that time period that had at least some degree of contest that would have involved people. And I think that's really important to bear in mind. So as the following description um, of General Peachy's procession through Taunton during the contested election of 1830 reveals the arrival of a candidate in town during a pre-reform election campaign was repeat with ritual and with a sense of occasion. It was also sound and color, as you can see in here. Voters and non-voters alike, men, women, and children are involved. They wore cockades and ribbons. We've got people talking about banners, colors, bunches of blue, blue ribbons, and so on. Um, carried banners, marched in processions, lined the streets, and gathered in the windows. And of course, windows, women in windows is such a common thing in 18th century elections that it becomes a trope in, in plays about uh, 18th century elections. They express their allegiances physically, visually, and vocally. While the presence and approbation of that more delightful portion of creation, according to our writer here, was frequently commented upon by contemporary reporters, it would be vastly underplaying women's electoral involvement if we assumed that their involvement in elections in this period, at any level of society, stopped at providing incidental color or serving as appropriately bedecked political window dressing. Women in the 18th century were certainly members of the political crowd of the extra parliamentary nation, but they were also active participants in the electoral process. Even in boroughs like Taunton, which did not see the involvement of aristocratic women as patrons or organizers or canvassers, or uh, as a borough, not, it wasn't one of the ones that gave women folk electoral privileges of Burgage boroughs and Freeman boroughs, about which I'll say more later, women can still be found taking part in elections both <coughs> formally and informally. They participated in the processions and the treats, they sewed banners and made cockades, they served copious amounts of bread, cheese, beer, and cider to voters and non-voters alike. They could capitalize on the influx of business to their shops, taverns, and lodging houses. And they served as witnesses, formally, to prove and disprove votes. Now, women who owned property, of course, that gave their tenants a vote might have say about, uh, something to say about that. And voters' wives were also much more likely to be canvassed as um, if there was a contested election in the offing, to the point where you get these kinds of satirical prints about the canvassing of a voter's wife. They were frequently canvassed, canvassed by candidates and their agents, as they were presumed to have, and often did have, and we heard about this earlier this morning already, influence over their tenants or their husbands' votes. Coaxed, cajoled, and sometimes kissed, voters' wives might also be offered small amounts of cash or deucers, Offers of drink, dresses, possibly in the candidates' colors, and the payments of debts were not uncommon either, nor were hints of or threats to future patronage for a family. While some women were flattered, persuaded, or cowed into agreement, others took open pleasure in resisting all blandishments, proudly proclaiming their personal or familial independence. And I've just got one there about this is a tenant's wife or a tenant who is, got, is putting pressure on, sorry, this is a landowner who's putting pressure on her tenant to make sure he votes for who, he, who um, uh, she 
she wants it to. And then here we've got um, a, um, a from a canvassing book by Lord Townsend, who's canvassing a Tamworth in 1765, and he notes, the wife governs against us. And then again, in another person, place later in the same canvassing book, he's got another person who says, he wished us well, but his wife governed. And you get this kind of thing. The most formidable of voters' wives might even use the election to settle old personal scores with the local men who canvassed them, or may pointedly make depositions of bribery and corruption against canvassers whom they felt had been disrespectful. And so here we've got voters' wife who is at the bottom, if you take a look at that, she's saying, she's saying basically, if that debt isn't paid, he's not voting. <coughs> and here, this is from the... Um, Depositions in the Taunton election when it comes to <coughs> Parliament. We've got Mary Godfrey Treby, and basically she's saying this guy came and offered me money for my vote, and he was rotten. He was absolutely nasty to me. He cussed and he swore when he found out that I was going wasn't going to do this and that I was going to go to Parliament and and protest what he was doing. And you get this kind of thing going on um, in there. Now, what's really interesting about these kinds of, of sources is that. These are the kinds of women often who are completely missing from the source historical records otherwise. We find in controverted election papers, female servants, tavern keepers, laundresses, chimney sweeps, chimney sweeps' wives, and the like, who joined local men at candidates' expenses to testify in Parliament. Ironically, the depositions of women like these, who did not vote themselves and were outside the imagined male political nation, serve to shape parliamentary decisions and determine election outcomes. And I think that's also worth thinking about when you think about electoral culture. Now, it's important to stress that while 18th century contemporaries presumed that the polity was male and the politics should be men's business, there was a significant gap between rhetoric and reality when it came to women's participation in electoral politics. As long as a woman's electoral involvement could be rationalized as dutiful, dignified, and familial, with the emphasis on familial, it was unlikely to be problematic, even if that meant supporting an unrelated man who was representing a family interest. The more hotly contested the election, however, the more likely women were to be involved at all levels of society. For the women of the political elite, participation in electoral politics varied according to personal circumstances, individual character, and commitment, but was generally an extension of the family's larger, holistic, socio-political involvement in the local community. Politics was a family business, and some degree of women's involvement was largely accepted by contemporaries and could even be demanded by male family members. As mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters of political families, their politics was primarily familial, occasionally factional. It was not feminist. Their activities became problematic only when they threatened to dissolve class boundaries, especially between elite women and laboring sort men, or when the women proved to be such charismatic political figures or successful canvassers that they emerged as political figures in their own rights and therefore implicitly challenged the established gender order. So the Pittites manufactured press scandal against Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, for allegedly kissing the butchers in 1784, offers as an example of one of these, and the criticism, for instance, offered against Lady Susan Kent. Um, of Oxfordshire for her high profile role in the Oxfordshire election of 1754 exemplifies the second. Um, and I'll just skip over that one. That gives you, you probably are familiar with some of these, these are the kinds of attack, attack uh, images on Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire. And here we've got Lady Susan Kett and one of the many, many pieces of absolutely execrable poetry that were written about her, accusing her and telling her basically to, you know, you're too old to do this, go home and you know, take up your housekeeping. You know, stop going up and canvassing and seeing with, with, with the voters. Now, what neither Lady Susan nor other 18th century women did, however, was vote, of course. While Vivian Larmony has recently uncovered proof of two 17th century women voting successfully in the parliamentary election, and a King's Bench ruling, Oliver v. Ingram, 1738 39 confirmed that women could vote for and hold minor parish offices, there is no evidence to date of 18th century women voting. At least I've never been able to find that. And I have not felt that they would be from the history of Parliament either. That said, variations in the franchise and in customary practice prior to reform meant that there were always some women who had recognized electoral privileges. The widows or daughters of freemen and freemen boroughs, free boroughs, 
frequently had the right to make their husbands into voters, whereas female burgage owners technically had the right to vote themselves in burgage boroughs. Taking these privileges together, women had, at least in theory, a legitimate interest in elections in up to 62% of all the boroughs prior to reform. Now, the most direct involvement in electoral politics lay with those women who inherited or purchased burgages in the country's 29 burgage boroughs. In these boroughs, the vote was attached to the ownership of a piece of property, and those women who owned the burgages had the legal right to vote until 1832. In Horsham and Sussex, for instance, 23% of the burgages were held by women in 1764. Now, by custom, husbands usually voted in the right of their wives, but single and widowed women appointed proxies to exercise their votes. Many of these were undoubtedly male relatives, but the avidity with which these women were canvassed during hotly contested elections and burgage bills were often contested, and the amount of money that they might be offered for their proxies or for their property speaks to their electoral importance. Burgage ownership was also a way of establishing or securing an elite family's political interest. Lady Andover included her burgages and her control over one seat at Castle Rising in her daughter's marriage portion in mid-century. Lady Irwin, who inherited the control over both seats at Horsham on her husband's death, fought repeated elections against the Duke of Norfolk between 1778 and 1807, and it succeeded in retaining control of the borough and bequeathing it and her political interest there to her daughter on her death. Other elite women managed burgage girls for absent husbands or underage sons. Even Sir James Lothar, the century's outstanding boroughmonger, um, owes a debt to his widowed mother Catherine. She pur purchased 27 burgages in Appleby between 1751 and 54, while he was still minor. And in 1756, she had a, a burgage fight battle, basically, um, with Lord Egremont for the, for the control of the borough of Cockermouth. Now, the importance of politically active widows, controlling family interests, should not be underestimated. According to John Cannon, 70% of 18th century aristocratic families went through at least one minority or a period where the heir to the estate was a child. The Dukes of Bedford was 33.5 years. Uh, they were minors in the 18th century. Those of Buford, 28 years. Those of Hamilton, 19 years. The women who managed these interests often operated in much the same way as their male counterparts. They tended to work together with stewards and committees to plan strategy and canvassing, often used tendencies to their electoral advantage and direct votes. They held treats for freeholders, flattered local gentry with entertainments and public days, and canvassed their peers in person and by letter. Now, it depended on how active the woman was, but these are the kinds of things you find them doing. Significantly, they also drew upon their female as well as their male networks in order to, to secure results. <laughs> now, there was a small group of women who always managed to control seats in Parliament as a result of this, and whose political influence was recognized both in the locality and in the nation by politicians managing elections in London. Thus, for instance, we've got the Dowager Lady Orford's control of both seats at Collington, one seat at Ashburton uh, in the 1750s and 60s, Harriet Pitt, who's controlling one seat at Pontrefact since uh, between 1756 and her death in 1763, and other women like Lady Downing, who tried very hard to keep control of Dunwich and Suffolk between 1764 and her death in 1778, but didn't succeed. And that she's interesting because she's the kind of person who's involved at the time and recognized at the time, but gets lost in history because she's not immediately visible in the sources. So records of election campaigns underline the familial nature of politics for the uh, political elite at the time. Sisters, mothers, wives, widows might step in as family representatives to cover for absent, ineffective, or underage men or work in conjunction with male family members to run election committees, organize canvassers, and direct campaigns. Elizabeth Cook, for instance, seemingly out of frustration, took over her absent brother's ill-organized campaign for Derbyshire in 1710. She led the <coughs> planned uh, strategy, oversaw the canvassing, tracked the votes, and used her social skills to try and win over the neighbors that her husband and her brother were annoyed. She also increasingly wrote to chide her brother about his non-appearance in the bur borough. Once the election was over, she stepped back seemingly seamlessly into her familial role. Georgina, uh, Lady Spencer, this is the mother of Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, 
um, similarly managed elections in St. Albans for a decade, for decades for her husband and her son, while they were preoccupied with campaigns in other family groups. Despite being a political woman to her fingertips, she exemplified the tension some women felt in electioneering. Although she clearly enjoyed planning strategy and directing the committee, she was very careful to protect her reputation and preserve her physical and social distance from the electorate itself. So for instance, when she's canvassing in Northampton, which she does twice in 1774, with the Spencer family candidate, she makes sure that she stays in her cabriolet, which is, which is drawn around the town by, by the townsfolk, the cheering crowd, and stays self-safely elevated above the crowd, where she's able to speak to the people, and as she says, put a little spirit into our people, um, but she doesn't threaten either her and the social divide or her reputation. These appearances, of course, she thinks, um, she says in her letters, thought and turned the election for the Spencer candidate. Now, women did not retreat quietly, and I'll just give you that one as, a, as another example. It's another political <coughs> widow, uh, Duchess of Rutland, who's looking for patronage in this case to try and secure voters, both at the beginning of the, the uh, quotation and at the end. People who are likely to defect if she can't get patronage. And getting quite patronage from William Pitt is difficult. But she's close to Pitt, and so she's, she's quite happy to write to him. Now, in conclusion, women did not retreat quietly into the confines of the domestic sphere as a result of either the nastiness of the 1784 election or concerns about gender and politics that were revivified by the French Revolution. Three interrelated strands of electoral involvement become increasingly clear in the first half of the 18th century, the 19th century. I think we've already heard some of this already uh, earlier today. While women in England were legally precluded from voting as a result of reform in 1832, and the inter introduction of the 10-pound householder franchise cons consigned to the past both Burgage and Freeman boroughs, women did not lose their personal influence or their involvement in local elections. They were not immune, as we've already heard today, to radical politics, and would come to play an increasingly visible part in Chartism and anti-poor law agitation, uh, all of which had electoral implications. And at the top of society, the elite women's electoral involvement remained, remained largely unchanged. It continued to be based on factors including character, ability and experience, strength of political beliefs, family traditions and expectations, and specific election um, circumstances. Political expediency remained a great incentive to action. The biggest changes post-reform, as I see them, would come from the women of the middle classes, the counterparts of those women who welcomed General Peachy to Taunton in 1830 by lining the windows and waving their handkerchiefs. It's they who would begin to attend the political meetings. They're the Harriet Groats of this society. They would sign the anti-corn law petitions in the tens of thousands. And it is they whose teas and bazaars would defray the cost of voter registration and election expenses. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, we'll say goodbye to you. I'm sorry I have to go. Thank you very much. Um, Gary, talk to you. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So uh, this will also be a bit of a quick gallop. Um, uh, before 1872, it was thought by many that the secret ballot would lead, would lead to more peaceful elections. Now, electoral violence was a common feature of election contests throughout the UK and had been for centuries. What hasn't thus far been known is the extent of this violence throughout the age of reform, nor the trends over time. And what we can say now is that the elections were far, far more violent than has been thought. Moreover, the idea that voting reform might go hand in hand with progression and perhaps improvement of electoral conduct is not borne out. Already serious levels of violence actually increased substantially towards the middle and later part of the Victorian era, including after the introduction of the ballot, before dropping dramatically and permanently after the 1880s. So by way of context, uh, this paper is a byproduct of the uh, Durham University ESRC project 
on the causes and consequences of electoral violence evidence from England and Wales 1832 to 1914. And we're on the lookout for a good acronym if anybody has one. <laughs> um, so uh, for this we used exceptionally detailed records. Um, in addition to parliamentary petitions and royal commission evidence, um, we consulted 1.3 million newspaper articles containing an estimated 2.1 billion words spanning 1,081 provincial and national titles. Now, the articles were initially selected by employing machine learning for the initial retrieval of reports likely to contain references to election violence. Uh, once retrieved, these around 19,000 likely violent newspaper articles were manually read, analyzed, and coded by our team of trained research assistants. Uh, the violence we found comprises everything from individual kidnapping, assaults, the occasional duel, to property damage and um, ranging up to outright rioting. Now, the last attempt to quantify mid-Victorian violence in 2007 by Wasserman and Jaggard found a total of one riot and five major disturbances for the 1857 election. Now, 57 is generally thought to be one of the quieter contests of this period, and they were right insofar as it was comparatively quiet, but even so, we found at least four riots and 12 serious disturbances. Uh, the number of smaller incidents, including individual assaults, property damage, killings, etc., runs into the dozens for all elections and occasionally into the hundreds. Uh, of the around 2,900 events we found in total, around 800 were more serious disturbances and 260 were riots. Now, excluding by elections, there were 7,154 constituency elections in England and Wales in the 20 general elections. Of that number, 1,370, 20%, uh, <coughs> so one in five, saw at least one violent event. Our work suggests that almost 93% of constituencies saw electoral violence at some point during the 1832 to 80 period. So I think it's no exaggeration to say that violence was an endemic feature of everyday electoral life. Uh, violence happened all over the country, north to south, east to west, city, town, village, and country. Uh, we've created a publicly available interactive map uh, of all the election violence for everybody to look at, and if you use it yourself, you'll find that few places are represented. So uh, just to give a fairly standard example of mid-Victorian electoral writing, uh, this picture is of Market Square at Nottingham in the present day. That's the uh, same Market Square in 1865 portrayed during the general election. Hired thugs had waited around the town centre for election candidates to make an appearance. When the candidate very prudently, it must be said, decided to make themselves scarce, the thugs took hold of the hustings platform, set fire to it and burned it to the ground. They then pelted um, the supporters of both candidates with stones, causing severe injuries. A mob comprising thousands of people took control of the marketplace, law and order broke down altogether for several hours, and, uh, with the police not being able to restore peace. And that was not in even the most violent riot of that particular election in England and Wales. It's really one of the best for the screen there. So let's now look at change over time. And um, this strongly suggests that previous scholarship has misjudged the trends and indeed the overall evolution of electoral violence as a phenomenon. The decades immediately following 1832, when politics still retained much of its boisterous and carnivalesque Georgian flavour, were substantially less violent than the supposedly more staid mid and late Victorian court contests which followed. In fact, the most single violent election that we have found is 1885, the third such contest to be held after the passing of the secret ballot. So if we just take a brief look at a narrative taking in the election surrounding the introduction of the ballot and represented there as the red line on the graph. During the 30-day 1860 election campaign immediately before the ballot, there were no fewer than 37 riots, 117 disturbances, 193 more violent incidents, and 17 deaths in England and Wales alone. This doesn't, of course, take in Ireland, which by any general um, consensus is perhaps more violent on average. Uh, during the, uh, just to take uh, some examples here, at the nomination for East Cumberland in Woodton, a man's arrest triggered an election crowd who followed the police to their station house, throwing missiles, breaking the station house's windows, and injuring officers, eventually descending into a riot and the riot act being read. In Habit, Southern Hampshire, hired roughs disturbed the peace, destroying property, and caused many injuries. Uh, conservative voters were targeted and had difficulty polling because of the attacks. 
in East Kent at the polling at Whitstable, a man was charged with encouraging a mob of around 100 people to enter a pub with the purpose of assaulting a police sergeant. To the west, a Welsh party supporter in Linelli knocked down a member of a crowd with his horse, after which the rider was attacked by the crowd. Now, the 37 diverse riots and 17 deaths of this post-reform election in 68 inter compare interestingly, I think, to the 27 riots uh, which broke out in the post-reform 1832 contest and its 20 deaths. So the York Herald in 1869, commenting on the committee deliberations surrounding the Future Ballot Act, stated that they did not regard secret voting in the light of the panacea for the evils of our electoral <coughs> system, but recommended it as a valuable means of ensuring peace and order during election times. There is something elevating in the thought that the days of electioneering riot and debauchery are numbered, that elections will no longer be turned into scenes of brutality and violence, which in many instances have made freedom of election an empty sound. This was, as soon became clear, somewhat optimistic. In 1874, the election immediately after the ballot, there is a drop in violence, but still far more violence than any of the eight elections which had happened in the period 1832 to 59. And it was still the third most violent election of our period 1832 to 1910. So an editorial in the Sheffield Daily Telegraph summed up, a good many cases now being tried at the spring assizes arise out of riots during the general election. It was hoped the ballot would put a stop to violence and attempts at intimidation. But the experience of the last six weeks shows that human nature in the voter or non-voter has not been changed by the ballot act. The rough horseplay of the old nominations has also been abolished, and if the ballot, amid its many drawbacks, does not give us peace and quietness of elections, one of its chief recommendations will have come to nothing. So the two subsequent elections taken together, 1874 and 80, together witnessed at least 57 riots, 140 disturbances, 265 violent incidents, and 13 deaths between them. In 1880, nearly half of all English and Welsh constituencies experienced at least one violent event, and 1880 is in the largest election in terms of the number of constituencies simultaneously experiencing a violent event, so one in two contests. So the Corrupt and Illegal Practices Act of 1883 followed, as did the Third Reform Act in 1884 and the Redistribution Act in 1885. Now, general opinion, perhaps, was that the 1885 electoral contest perhaps saw less bribery and treating, but it certainly didn't show any letter from violence, quite the opposite. England and Wales saw at least 26 riots, 115 disturbances, and 252 violent incidents alongside five deaths. To be clear, this is, by most measures, the most violent election of the period we have examined. Uh, the reforms of 1883 to 5, which include significant franchise extension specifically in the counties, also saw for the first time more violence in the counties than in the boroughs, and this rural skew of violence continued up to 1910. So let's go from the national to local and look at one constituency. And I think I'm probably the fifth speaker today to have mentioned Pontefract. <laughs> um, I don't know them, namely <coughs> half dozen, but. <laughs> no, never mind. Uh, so between 1832 and its famous groundbreaking secret ballot by-election, things were peaceful. Uh, this wasn't to last. We found no violence thus far in, in, in newspapers and other sources. But after the introduction of the ballot in 1872, violence occurred in the next five general elections in a row, some of it fairly serious. Uh, during the 1874 election in Pontefract, miners caused a disturbance on polling day and some were arrested. Later, groups from the collieries don't cause damage to random properties after the declaration of results. At the next election in 1880, a liberal mob from nearby Nottingley descended on Pontefract armed with sticks. They proceeded to attack conservatives, fights broke out, windows were smashed, and they attempted to storm the local conservative club. Voters were intimidated and attacked outside the polling station. At the next election in 1885, an outright riot broke out following the declaration of the poll. Liberals again attacked homes and offices of Conservatives, including the Conservative Club and the chief agent of the Conservative candidate. Police paraded the streets and clashed with the crowd, and emergency special constables needed to be sworn in. In 86, a year later, again after the declaration of results, the disturbances broke out and windows were broken. And finally, in 1892, there was rioting during polling and after the declaration of results, <coughs> numerous assaults on police were recorded. In short, Pontefract went from a clean record to five pretty violent general elections in a row. 
Now, I think the most important thing to note about this is that it was still possible for even a historically peaceful constituency to suddenly experience repeated <coughs> outbreaks of election violence in the late Victorian period. Such violence was not merely the persistence of pre-reform electioneering rituals, the survival of Georgian or local culture. Violence could be entirely novel, even after the demise of traditional flashpoints for violence, such as the nomination and the hustings. It took place at a time when party systems were much more organized and working class participation in formal politics much more advanced. Now, the, the secret ballot also contributed to changing the character of much of this violence. So, before the ballot, um, as we've heard, um, voter choices were, of course, a matter of public record. Name votes, and even as in the case in this, um, on the screen, home addresses or registered addresses for potential targeting printed in local newspapers. Being a voter before the ballot, in light of all of this violence, could leave individuals very exposed. And this was increasingly true as the century wore on, as more seats were contested and more electors called on to actually use their votes. Individual intimidation, escalating to assault and destruction of their property, was a real fear for many. Parties often hired bodyguards to protect their individual voters and their houses in the run-up to elections. One elector in Norwich even hired his own personal bodyguard because he had been assaulted at a previous election. In 1832 in Hartford, for instance, at this type of violence was again endemic. Thugs imported from outside the town assaulted specifically targeted local voters to discourage them from voting. And one voter was assaulted half a dozen times across two weeks just while he was walking through the town. Now, ballot largely removed the ability to employ this unsavory electioneering method. Voter choices were now anonymous, and what's more, because of natural increases and the natural format, there were many more voters in each constituency. Violence and intimidation, which focus purely on individuals, is not viable in these circumstances. However, targeted individual attacks did persist. But these now focus much more on prominent partisan figures. During the 1880 Ware election in Dorset, for instance, liberals allegedly hired a large body of drunken thugs for the more general purpose of disrupting the election. But they were also directly assaulted the declared supporters of Conservative candidate John Earl Drax, and eventually they attacked Drax himself. And just as a side note, Wareham is currently located in the present day constituency of South Dorset, which um, is still represented by members of the Drax family. <laughs> um, but more often, um, violence was adapted to the new circumstances. While individual votes, voters could be targeted unless they were wearing party colours, groups of voters could be targeted, albeit less precisely, where they divided up by wealth, location, or similar. <coughs> So a good example of this can be found in Birmingham during the 1880 election, where there were several polling stations in different areas throughout the city. At the Ladywood station, hired roughs illegally pretended to be special police constables to prevent entry to polling stations, causing fights. At St Paul's station, 50 drunken conservatives threatened people trying to vote, requiring half a dozen policemen to be called in. And at St Stephen's station, roughs allegedly prevented liberals from voting and demanded money from them before storming the Conservative Committee headquarters, requiring the intervention this time of a dozen policemen. Uh, Conservatives deliberately targeted these three specific polling stations, located in areas which were known to be strongholds of Liberal support. Elsewhere in the country in 1880 and in during other general elections, supporters of both parties participated in mass voter suppression. So what were the reasons for the marked increase in violence during this period, 1868 to 1885? Um, there are many. They include popular anger and unrest, um, uh, a feeling um, perhaps shared among the part during the franchise that um, they had a right to participate in boisterous, virgin and violent ways. Um, the continuing the declining atmosphere of popular celebration <coughs> and drunkenness, which accompanied many Victorian election contests. But as the Birmingham example illustrates, a hitherto underestimated factor is the continuation and expansion, I think, of wider corruption, specifically the hiring of thugs by interested parties, known at the time by many names, but most commonly as hired roughs. Now, the brief peak of the hired rough in Victorian elections um, directly coincided with the brief peak of electoral violence more generally. Now, the Second Reform Act and Ballot Act did not reduce the role of hired roughs in elections any more than <coughs> violence, at least in the short to medium term. In fact, these reforms may have inadvertently increased the comparative appeal of what we might call dirty money to hire roughs, rather than instead to bribe electors. Roughs could disrupt political meetings and disrupt election proceedings on polling day for the same price as before, 
but the bribery was becoming more expensive and more unreliable, given larger electorates and secret voting. And there is um, evidence, um, uh, testimonials to this in royal commissions uh, looking at um, elections in Norwich after the ballot. So um, this is at least partly why I think recorded violence appears to increase after the introduction of the ballot. Small-scale harassment of occasionally leading to violence <coughs> against individual voters is much less likely to be visible before the ballot. The two examples I gave in Norwich and Hartford actually came not from newspapers but from Royal Commission and election petition evidence. It doesn't get reported in newspapers. But mass voter suppression, by contrast, tends to be a bigger, messier, and much more noticeable phenomenon. Other changes also contributed to the increase in violent events related to the culture and the structure of elections. In Birmingham during the 1880 violence, for instance, there were many different polling stations and a lot of political meetings were held in the run-up to the election, which became violent. Before the 1870s, we were talking about fewer polling stations and fewer political meetings, so in essence, fewer opportunities for violence to break out, fewer flashpoints. The size of the elections <coughs> also have reduced. Uh, the Nottingham Hustings riot that I mentioned earlier may only have been one event, but it was much more larger and intense than the three smaller polling station events in Birmingham after the ballot in 1818. But although challenged in recent years, I think it's fair to say that the view, in the public view perhaps, of um, British democratic evolution in the 19th century is a largely peaceful and linear um, process still holds significant sway. Um, electoral violence, however, was not in any steady or inevitable decline. The extent of violence and its notable increase as the century wore on strongly challenges this narrative. The election of 1885 was the peak of violence at general elections. It didn't continue at a similar frequency until the outbreak of the Great War, nor did it fall back to the level seen in 1832-59. Instead, it declined markedly, suddenly, and permanently to very low comparative levels, and the bottom graph is the one that really emphasizes this, that only looks at the riots and the disturbances. And the 1883 Corrupt Practices Act, with its strict limit on election spending and illegal payments to colour carriers in like who I might suggest were carrying bludgeons as often as they might be carrying flags, um, was a significant factor in successfully curtailing the employment of roughs alongside other electioneering banalities. Now, the Ballot Act was an essential underpinning to this, as was franchise extension. Other factors, including the increasing social unacceptability of violence, um, improvement and expansion of provincial police forces, and the decline in election entertainment and spectacle also played a role. The ballot, as we've heard earlier, was no panacea, but it was an integral part of the overall long-term remedy to the phenomenon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Karen. So, are you probably going to take us from this lively, colourful world into the supposedly dry procedural of the branch party meeting. Um, one that, that is, according to, to some interpretations of the 19th century, um, a, a kind of a, a symptom and a consequence of a, a changing political world that becomes less participatory, more exclusionary, and closed down overall but which I think actually opens up a whole set of new questions as to how the acceptable boundaries of political participation, representation, and opinion are, are kind of thought about and fought over in the 19th century. So I'm gonna focus on some examples from the 1886 election, which uh, comes hot on the heels of the reforms that Gary's just been talking about, but it also comes after a major policy innovation in the shape of uh, the Liberal government's adoption of Irish Home Rule, which is a proposal to grant a parliament to Dublin for the management of Irish affairs, and also a major party split and a realignment within the kind of uh, Liberal and Conservative parties more broadly. So it's essentially electoral bingo, if you want to think about it that way. Um, we know that the organisation of grassroots party supporters for political and especially electoral purposes was by this period nothing new, but what starts to shift is very much the centrality of those organisations to the electoral cycle and to what's happening outside it, particularly as a result of those reforms, 
with their restrictions on spending, the enfranchisement of far larger sections of the population, and also in more potentially remote areas, which starts to change the ways in which electioneering and political education need to be done. And also the 1885 redistribution starts to undermine a lot of the kind of electoral compacts that allow rival factions within parties to kind of maintain a bit of a balance and means that parties have to overhaul their organisational arrangements. You also start to get in the period uh, kind of immediately preceding and after the, the Ballot Act, um, the emergence of liberal party organisations in particular that claim to be organised and, and function along popular and representative lines. And in theory, they're meant to function almost as parliaments outside parliament, which is one of the phrases that uh, Joseph Chamberlain, who's one of the major innovators, uses to describe what he wants to happen through these, these changes. They're supposed to place the management of the party into the hands of the people, however that's defined, and provide a kind of concentrated means for expressing rank and file opinion that then kind of gets reflected to candidates, to MPs, to the party leadership, and it's supposed to then help shape the party policy. From a candidate's perspective, this is in turn supposed to help uh, give them a legitimacy, because if a, an association is elected in its membership by those who claim themselves to be the liberal electors of a constituency, then that then makes that association's constituency the body of liberal electors locally. This also should then theoretically keep that MP in touch with local feeling through uh, public or branch meetings or through the passage of resolution. And these are very much ideal type um, theories and, and bodies organised to uh, what was known as the Birmingham model um, from its origination in, in Birmingham through, through the kind of Chamber Night uh, initiatives were not really the norm in the kind of decade after the Ballot Act but start to get uh, more common after the 1883-5 reforms, particularly when new and revised associations start to spring up to, to deal with this changing electoral environment. Now, none of this goes unchallenged. Rival groups within constituencies claim that they and their organisations best represented local sentiment. And this is something that's been happening as a dynamic long before the 1872, before, uh, the 1872 Ballot Act, but which again gains a heightened significance in the, the new electoral context of the 1880s. Or different bodies might even deny the authority of any kind of one organisation to speak for or to the community. So into this kind of rapidly changing environment comes Gladstone's Irish Home Rule Bill. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is the kind of ways in which local constituency associations responded to the Liberal Party MPs who voted against the bill and who essentially helped bring down the Liberal government. Um, so the bill is introduced in April 1886 and it, it lost on its second reading at the early part of June. Um, then follows a really chaotic and often acrimonious general election, which is the second in only eight months. The Liberals lose it in common with Conservatives, backed by the votes in Parliament of Liberals who disagree with Gladstone on Home Rule. And home rule is a really divisive issue, and it's one that many of you hadn't actually been before the electorate at the 1885 election, in which case 1886 becomes supposedly the, the first opportunity for the public to declare its views on a policy that is potentially going to either create peace with Ireland or destroy the Union and ultimately the Empire. Although in 1885 the Liberal Party hardly presented a united front to the electors, 1886 seems to be a moment when its future direction and even principles were at stake. So this all adds a huge amount of significance to who is going to stand in the constituencies in the name of Liberalism, particularly <coughs> where those MPs voted for the <coughs> rule. It's also important to emphasise that in, in making decisions on candidate selection, the, the local party associations are not coming to this cold. For two months when the bill has been before Parliament, they are debating the, the, the questions that it raises and proclaiming their views predominantly through resolutions, but also a few petitions here and there, although petitions were 
largely the new initiative device in 1886. Before I go on to that in a bit more detail, I just think it's, it's important to, to think about some of the kind of discourses that are circulating in the late 19th century and to do that by comparing the ways in which the secret ballot was justified or opposed and party organisations <coughs> were depicted. So take for instance the idea that the ballot is un-English, then so too are the Liberals' organisational innovations according to their critics particularly after the National Liberal Federation is founded in 1887, people within the Conservative Party, but also the Liberal Party and the Labour movement start referring to Liberal Associations pejoratively as the caucus. This term originated in the US to describe a system of party management and candidate selection. And this is a term which sticks. Associations were increasingly portrayed as self-appointed cliques zealots out of touch with but claiming to represent local liberals and making dangerous demands upon their parliamentary representatives. If the ballot can be justified as a barrier to bribery and intimidation, then the caucus can be condemned as, as introducing a new coercive force in local and national politics. Where the secret voting might be uh, risking a degrading of the elector, the caucus with its shadowy wire pillars could turn an MP into a delegate who is expected to vote as instructed rather than according to the dictates of his own conscience, or else he might risk losing his seat at the hands of the local party association. The manly forbearance of candidates and voters appearing before the election crowd could be mirrored in that of the grassroots leader or MP who would withstand approbation of the caucus. If the vote was a trust bestowed on the elector and exercised on behalf of the community, then the caucus arrogated to itself a power and authority that it had no right to claim, and acted from partisan motives, as it had been feared that voters shielded by the ballot might do so. The caucus, moreover, can be portrayed as a privatised form of political conduct, charged with stifling the genuine debate that would alone identify public interest and opinion and which might alternately be found in open voting or be made possible by the ballot. And the caucus might be seen as suppressing free speech in the name of a faddist conception of liberalism and an artificial uniformity. It also deprived the voters of choice, apparently, picking behind closed doors a man who towed the party line, which was a far cry from the public nomination abolished in 1872, where theoretically both electors and non-electors would unencumbered have their say. So as I mentioned, uh, the period prior to the election is one of a, of a kind of fever pitch of activity, and over a thousand meetings are organised by nearly as many liberal associations to discuss home rule. They were largely in favour of the policy. Their defenders expressed, is, is, insisted that Far from usurping rights, associations were merely expressing said rights, declaring the independent, authoritative voice of the people. They had a duty to perform. They would help the country in reaching a decision through mature discussion. And indeed, one of the reasons that such bodies existed was to inform and guide public opinion. Meetings were in turn intended to be a source of opinion, as of information for MPs. These MPs had a right to their own opinions, but they should recognise that so too did their constituents. Their critics, both liberal unionist and conservative, counter that the caucus had no authority to speak on kind of major matters of national policy or interest, and that it sought to falsify, falsify opinion by dictatorial means, passing manufactured homogenous resolutions at whole informal meetings that did not represent or intended to exclude the public. After all, a bill which had absolutely no merits could only be passed by intrigue and by the slavish devotees of a would-be demagogue and the coercion of MPs into abandoning their political liberty. So by the time that the election comes around, the relationships between the liberal associations and, on the one hand, those they claimed to represent in the constituency, and on the other, those who then represented the constituency in Parliament, were firmly in the spotlight. That the election happens pretty much immediately after the bill is defeated on its second reading means that decisions have to be made fast. And these prompt questions as to how the caucus operates as a so-called machine and the distinctions between its various different organisational functions, be they deliberative, programmative, or electoral. 
In several constituencies, local liberal associations move swiftly and decisively to condemn their MP's opposition and to deselect him. There were some high profile scalps. Two days after the second reading, liberals in Scotland's border birds dropped George Trevelyan, who had resigned from the Liberal cabinet over the policy. They did so at a public meeting where the man who would later replace him as candidate and his MP claims that Trevelyan represents not the mass of the people but himself and the minority. The, organization, the organizers of such meetings also emphasize their own representative credentials, which can potentially suggest that they are actually more in touch with local opinion and ultimately more representative than the MP himself. In Tyneside, Albert Graves, the scion of the great political family, was roundly criticised and was heckled pretty strongly at some of his constituency meetings. It's pointed out that associations making these decisions were created by the election of the voters and that this then legitimates their action on behalf of the constituency. In various different um, constituencies, we can, we can get a sense of how the Liberal Party was constructed at a local level and of the procedures that it follows at election time. So district associations were kind of base level associations in various different electoral districts in a constituency, having made that clear their attitude to their MP through their resolutions, appoint delegates to represent them at a meeting of the Central Constituency Association, which has overall responsibility for candidate selection and direction of the party locally. They then start to say that they're going to act in order to secure the proper representation of the Liberal Party locally. They, commit, they appoint a committee which is then intending to communicate with potential viable candidates. The names of these candidates then get presented to another constituency level meeting which makes the ultimate selection. <coughs> and you see this in, in various different constituencies across Scotland for instance. In some cases they do work, in others activists anger notwithstanding, they don't come to anything in terms of being able to then fight the election. So take the North Ayrshire for instance, five of the six district liberal associations condemn their MPs failure to take into account local opinion and urge the Central County Association to find a more suitable candidate who can be in touch with the liberalism of the division. It too appoints a committee, it talks to prospective candidates but no one is willing to stand. This is perhaps a sign of things to come because Liberals for, for years after the 1886 crisis, in part because of, of splits within local parties and the national party, in part because of financial <coughs> issues, struggle to find candidates in various different places. And it also suggests that while associations are, are happy to deliberate and declare upon the major issues of the day, they don't always have the electoral muscle to translate sentiment into seats. Association deselections are often met by fierce denunciations from Liberal Unionist MPs who draw on notions of independence and duty. So in Carmarthen boroughs in Wales, John Jenkins, who had faced public protest meetings prior to the second reading, gets dropped by his associations as candidate and then stands at the request of local Liberal Unionists. In letters to the press, he proudly declares his refusal to represent any constituency as a mere delegate and expresses his pleasure at not being in accord with those who would reduce the functions and duties of a representative to the servile following of a leader's policy, however wild and destructive. When Jenkins is adopted at meeting of liberal unionists, a letter is read out that John Bright, the great radical uh, thinker and leader, had written to another similarly besieged uh, MP. Bright lamented that unforgiving former Liberal friends were trying to make delegates of MPs and refusing to adopt those who would not surrender judgment and conscience to their demands on the sudden changes of their leader. So you start to see here a lot of different kind of concepts of representation how the chains of representation work and of the extent to which local activists and electors can make demands upon those that they claim that they have sent to Parliament. You also start to see questions about uh, kind of how, again, representative these, these associations are themselves. 
So take West Perthshire, for instance, where initially the general committee, which is the kind of everyday working body of the association, votes by 18 to 8 that having opposed the bill, Donald Curry no longer represents the liberalism of the division. This then necessitates a meeting of the executive committee, um, which is kind of responsible for some of the more um, intricate elements of, of association activity. <coughs> By the time that the executive gathers a week later, Curry supporters have must in force. They hadn't attended the first meeting because they hadn't expected that there would be opposition to him. They then turn up en masse, and there's a vote of 28 to 16 not to proceed with any opposition to Curry's candidature. Those who were originally in the majority but now in the minority cry foul. They claim that the association's decision has been rescinded and they hold a separate meeting and select a candidate so that electors will have the opportunity of expressing their views on the grave issues now before a country. These numbers are not in either case particularly large and I think it's, it's testament to, to some of the debates that start to develop over the extent to which there's a genuinely mass membership association. Uh, the local press in Perthshire points out that it's ridiculous that a decision such as this can be made by 18 individuals when you've got a constituency comprising 8,000 voters. But those associations would claim that they are, because they have been popularly elected at various different stages of their various different committees, actually more representative and participatory than the shadowy old liberal committees that once stood in charge of uh, candidate selection and representation in the constituencies. In other cases, there are some more straightforward decisions to adopt as candidate sitting anti-home rulers. In Sirencester, Arthur Winterbotham was adopted by the Liberal 200 <coughs> at a meeting where members, on the one hand, expressed their disapproval of his having voted against the bill and their disagreement with him on the issue of home rule, but also stressed that in the circumstances, the wisest thing to do is to support him. This would keep the party united. The Conservatives were not expected to stand a candidate against Winterbotham in Sirencester because they believed he was opposed to the bill. So there was no sense in making a division of the Liberal Party's own making. Similarly, in Sudbury in Suffolk, members of the Liberal Council explicitly declared in their resolution adopting Cuthbert Quilter that they had a view to continuing the unity of the Liberal Party. Its members agreed that after years of hard work, opposing quarter would now only play into the hands of the Tories, who would rejoice at a decision that would inflict a blow upon liberalism from which it would take many years to recover. And quarter was, after all, sound on many of the great English questions that needed settlement. So cases such as these suggest that potentially home rule was not always the, the kind of key priority for associations when deciding on candidates, despite its role in splitting the Liberal Party and coming later to be one of the defining principles on which the party has <coughs> operated for around 20 years. It also indicates a variety of conceptions of what made a man a Liberal. These associations endorse Liberals who happened to be Unionists, but not necessarily endorse them as liberal unionists, and there's an idea that the party might still be able to encompass these different views. On the flip side of this, you do of course have cases where home rule was the one issue upon which candidates were to be chosen. So in the middle of Morgan, for instance, you get candidates adopted on the express understanding that they have agreed to approve the future measure of home rule according to certain conditions. So Christopher Talbot has, has faced angry protests within his constituency prior to his vote against the bill, but then comes before the 200 which is the governing body and says he only did so because he was opposed to one particular clause. If Gladstone removed it, he'll vote for it. The constituency association then say, okay, this is a distinct pledge, you can be our OP again. This doesn't always work, unfortunately, and there are conflicting interpretations of how binding an MP's professions might be and of how realistic these expectations are. So over in Denbyshire West, William Cornwallis West, the MP, had chaired a major unionist set-piece demonstration in Wrexham 
which according to the Liberal District Association saw him collude with the Tory enemy and misrepresent liberal opinion. In June, when he speaks to the constituency's selection meeting, he claims that he turned merely in his capacity as the county's Lord Lieutenant and sets out some rather vague conditions for supporting a measure of Irish self-government, although not necessarily home rule. Several attendees demand that he be put aside for a more advanced candidate and table a resolution that requires from any candidate who would stand a pledge to support Gladstone's policy. The meeting kind of fudges things and, and narrowly carries an amendment regretting West's vote but trusting that he'll accept a reintroduced measure. This then angers some of the uh, constituency associations who demanded a pledge or a resignation from West and said that it's not really sufficient to endorse him with the expression of a mere hope for his future action. They're ultimately proved right, and the county association is disabused of its faith six months later when West, who had been returned unopposed, informed it that his views were unchanged and that he remained a Liberal Unionist. The association then declares him an unfit representative. So I want to conclude briefly by coming back to Birmingham, which is the seeming birthplace of the caucus system and encapsulates many of the issues that I've been discussing. It's somewhere that have been represented for nearly 20 years solidly by Liberals. In the hope of maintaining such representation uninterrupted, the Birmingham Liberal Association recommended that were the seven sitting Liberal MPs willing to stand again, there should be no change in the representation of the borough. Five have voted against and two for the bill. The association's rationale was that these men continued to be champions of liberalism and their contrasting votes reflected the diversity of opinion within the city. This compact held in five of the divisions, but the notion that the balance of representation should be maintained led to complex manoeuvring across the remaining two, which revealed the depth of division between home rulers and unionists. In Bordesley, in the southeast of the city, Henry Ward has supported the Bill of MP, but activist reports suggested strong opposition to it. In his resignation letter, Broadhurst alleges that influential work, uh, forces were at work in an operation against him. This prompts weeks of speculation as to the identity of said forces and emphatic denials from Joseph Chamberlain and from Jesse Collins who eventually stand in Bordesley as a Liberal Unionist and who at one heated meeting, when he almost gets in fisticuffs, describes the claim as insulting. This also has the potential to play into the hands of those who contended that Chamberlain was a master political manipulator. In addition to that Birmingham Liberal Association, which claims to represent all seven of the constituencies, each constituency had its own divisional Liberal Council responsible for candidate selection. Their rules required that to secure endorsement as official Liberal candidate, any nominee must obtain the votes of two-thirds of those present at a selection meeting, so a nominally democratic system. By the terms of the compact, Broadhurst should have been replaced as candidate by a fellow home ruler. Yet at the first meeting of the Baldwin Divisional Council, Francis Schnardhorst, the great Liberal organisation, great Liberal organiser who agreed to be nominated as a home ruler only if he was conducive to party loyalty got 89 votes to Collins' 100 and 18 remained neutral. The next meeting, which again tries to resolve this issue, has 111 votes for Schnardhorst and 109 for Collins, so you're at stalemate. Between these meetings there were reports of extreme tension and home rulers tried to convince Collins' backers to withdraw his name and allow Schnardhorst to be returned unopposed in the aim of averting collapse of the compact, contests elsewhere in the city, and the destruction of Birmingham liberalism as a united force. Collins' supporters push back and they claim that they're the ones subject to these influential forces. They had asserted their independence against them. And there were even questions about how far the divisional councils represented the majority of electors on home rule. These are potentially dangerous suggestions in Birmingham, given the historic insistence upon the representativeness and popular basis of its associations. So that's Bordesley. It prompts concerns in Birmingham North, where William Kenrick had voted against the bill and efforts were made from the off to challenge his candidacy by local home rulers. As the Birmingham Liberal Association is suggesting its compact, 
several members within the Northern Council's executive are arranging meetings, meetings of home rulers. They also fear that if Broadhurst retires from Bordsley, the balance of representation in the city is going to be rendered disproportionate if a Liberal Unionist is successful there. As in Bordsley, two meetings of the full Northern Divisional Council can't agree upon a candidate. This is where it starts to get really interesting. The two divisional councils appoint committees to talk to one another to see if this deadlock can be broken and reach an understanding for a Gladstonian to be run in Bordsley and Kenrick to remain in the north. This should bring peace in the constituencies and maintain liberal representation in Birmingham. So again, the idea that liberal unionists are liberals. Collins, however, refuses to yield and intends to stand with or without the majority. His supporters too remain intransigent. So the negotiations collapse, Kenrick still can't get the votes, and stands anyway. What's then remarkable is that in Birmingham, the homeland of the supposed electoral machine, the Board City Council says we can't meet our rules, therefore we withdraw any further part in this electoral contest. A hundred of its members then go away and support a home candidate. The Northern Council, where Kenrick does end up being uh, run as candidate and gets a two-thirds majority, only does so because his opponents withdraw from the council. So you've got a huge number of really complex manoeuvres happening here. You also get, in Birmingham North, complaints that its constituency associations, it as an individual constituency, should not be made responsible to or from the decisions of any other association or any other constituency within Birmingham as a whole. So this, essentially to conclude, is to say that while the participatory majoritarian concept of representation might be good in theory and might even encourage more participation in local politics and it might also be a really useful thing uh, discursively to portray one's one's democratic credentials, there's absolutely no guarantee of political, or in this case, electoral success. Well, we come, we come to the final session. Uh, I should say that, um, unfortunately, uh, we were going to be joined by Jess Garland uh, from the Electoral Reform Society. Uh, Jess emailed me this morning, she's not feeling well, so uh, very regretfully had to, had to pull out. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask our uh, two panelists, John and, and Robert, to make some uh, opening remarks. But then I, I really want to encourage a discussion. There's, there's so much knowledge uh, in, in this room. We've had such a rich discussion. The, the whole idea of, of um, history and policy, which has just celebrated its 20th anniversary and was founded, founded here in 2002, was to encourage a, a dialogue between professional historians and policy makers. History is intrinsic to the policy process, it is intrinsic to political discourse. And if, uh, if historians are not engaged, bringing good history to the table, other people will do, do it for them. So that, that is our duty, I think. And um, really, I, I, having allowed uh, uh, John and, and Robert to kind of set the scene, I, I really would encourage you to, to come in, uh, raise issues, raise questions of, of them, talk about some of the things that we've talked about today. So, we're really delighted to have with us uh, John and Robert. John Pullinger um, began his career as a st statistician in the Central Statistical Office, later the Office of National Statistics, rising to become Director of Social Statistics in 1996. He was subsequently Director General of Information Services and Librarian at the House of Commons. And then from 2014, he was the national statistic, statistician. I knew I was going to go there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you might have already done that. I was doing so well. Um, uh, and in May 2021, 
uh, he became chair of the Electoral Commission. So he's absolutely at the heart of current debates about electoral reform. And we're so grateful to him for uh, giving up his time uh, to, to be with us today. And, and equally grateful to uh, Robert Saunders. When I was thinking of people who I could invite in to put these sorts of debates in, into a broader um, historical perspective, I immediately thought of, of Robert. Uh, who is really in modern British history at Queen Mary, University of London. He has direct knowledge of the things that we've been talking about today. His 2016 monograph uh, was uh, Democracy and the Vote in British Politics, 1848 to 1867, the making of the, of the Second uh, Reform Act. Um, and very cannily, and, and Rob obviously could see what was in the wind, uh, he moved on from research of that book to researching a European referendum. <laughs> and uh, that resulted in his book, Yes to Europe, um, the 1975 referendum, and 70s Britain, which was published in 2018. But of course, at the time of the 2016 referendum, Robert was in a, a perfect position to, to bring that um, historical perspective to bear on debates. Uh, <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story maybe at the end of, of, of that. Uh, but, uh, well, there, there, there you are. But I mean, um, and I think Robert, I, I mean, those of us who are, who are, are on Twitter, I think have particular respect and admiration for, for, for Robert. He tweets as Red Historian and he has 40,000 followers. And, and I can tell you that it's not just, um, it's not just volume, his, his output on Twitter is of the very highest standard and, and it, it really, um, it does great credit to the historical profession in terms of his, his commentary on, on daily affairs. Um, so, um, uh, delighted to have them both. John, would you like to, to open up? Well, first of all, thank you for that very generous introduction. I mean, just, I guess everybody does know more or less what the Electoral Commission does, but just a few words about that to start with. Um, you know, our job is to oversee elections and referendums across the United Kingdom, and, and that means we are reporting to each of the legislatures of, of the UK, and uh, that is very interesting at the moment, given they are, well, in three cases, covered by different parties, and we don't quite know about the fourth moment, the time will tell. Um, but that is very interesting. So we, we oversee elections and referendums, but we also regulate political finance. And it's uh, interesting just coming in at the back of a discussion about corrupt and illegal practices and uh, certain resonances with some of the challenges that we face today. So that's what we do. Um, but um, I was particularly delighted to be invited to come here today. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, I, mean, I worked in the House of Commons as a librarian um, there for 10 years. And, tried my best to be an advocate for the history of Parliament and worked very much with Paul uh, over the years to, to make sure we had events in Parliament and we brought parliamentarians to the table. So they did all the things that we, we've just been talking about, of um, connecting um, practice and policy with history and recalling um, what the past might teach us. So that maybe we would do something occasionally, hopefully, better um, in the future. And, Certainly my experience is a lot of parliamentarians in both houses that really do respect and are interested in history and uh, we certainly have an avid follow don't you? Uh, so it's a delight to, to, to be here and I mean it's a double delight because we're here to, um, well I chose my word after a chat with Paul, dissect the 1872 Ballot Act, but I think also I'm, I'm pleased we've been talking today about corruption legal practices and some of the other things which have got to resonance today. Um, and teach us of the importance of deconstructing um, what Parliament has done and what it intended to do and what the consequence of what it has done are for, for, for all of us. And um, to be part of that debate is very instructive for me today. Um, now, I've only come in last minute just now, but I did come in, in, in time to hear that um, uh, violence peaks immediately after a major Elections Act. So I'm extremely worried about that, given the <laughs> Elections Act um, 2020. <laughs> and we'll see whether history repeats itself in that respect. Hopefully, hopefully 
not. <laughs> so that's my way of kind of thanking you for having me here today. But we are here today at an extraordinary moment. I mean, we're here at the moment of sadness and mourning on the passing of the Queen, and we're just walking around London the last couple of days. There is a stillness that I can't think I've ever seen before, and particularly first thing this morning, I was walking um, uh, just alongside the House of Parliament, and it's totally quiet, and traffic, everything's stopped. Um, people are very... Um, <coughs> and, uh, so there's a special moment, and we're kind of having this discussion in that moment. There's two parts of the moment that have struck me, thinking about what I might say at this event. The first is what the King chose to say in his address to Parliament yesterday, where absolutely central to what he was saying was his role and duty to uphold the Constitution and our system of parliamentary democracy. Um, and you can be confident that his council will be informed by what has brought us to this place in the state of our democracy and how we can learn from that. But I think that statement certainly touched me in thinking about my role, but I hope it touches you in thinking about what you as historians who are interested in our constitution and our parliamentary democracy can add to that debate, not just with him, but with everyone else who might also have been touched by his words. So that's the first thing that kind of um, settled in my brain as I was thinking about today. But the second thing that settled in my brain was the word that seems to have caught the mood as we reflect on the life of the Queen, which is this word constancy, which I've rarely heard used in public discourse before, but now it's a, a common word that um, uh, I've seen in many places capturing um, her life and her, her spirit. And I think for our debate today, um, the interpretation I'm seeing put on the word constancy isn't constancy in the way a mathematician or statistician might think about it, an immutable number that is unchanging for all time, um, but it is a constancy in two dimensions. The first is the constancy of service, and the second is the constancy of morality and values. And I think those two things are absolutely at the heart of the ideas behind the ballot act, but also the ideas behind how we run elections today. So constancy of service to me means really being in tune with the people you are serving today, with the spirit of what we learn from the past. How can we construct elections that are not marred by violence? And we talked a bit about in the last question about violence against women, and there's, there's still a, 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 a real question around um, the, the position of, of women in elections today, which I might come to. Um, so the constancy of service is, is, is not keeping it the same, but have the same determination to serve the people in their elections and make sure all the people are, are well served. But the second thing is kind of constancy around um, morality and values. And that goes to the corrupt and legal practices point, which isn't so much about services, it's about people's feelings of kind of respect, um, <coughs> particularly respect for elections, because the key point for elections is that people accept them, even if they haven't voted for a particular outcome. And we have in this country the most extraordinarily high levels of public confidence in the outcome of elections, and we poll on this every year, and it is pretty much undimmed, um, and in fact, particularly high levels in the last year, which is extraordinary in some ways, given so much of the, the other discourse around the kind of collapse of, of um, well, <coughs> morals um, in, in, in public life in, in, in many, many places. Um, but in thinking about what I might say today, but those are my kind of anchor points, the, 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 the comments on the comments <coughs> already made, and the reflections on the life of the Queen. So that felt appropriate to me. Um, so I start, I start really from there. So the first um, <coughs> thought I had is about the law. So we had the Ballot Act, and this is just a brief conversation with, with Paul and a little bit of um, <coughs> I'm not an expert on the subject. 
subject. I mean, it was a groundbreaking reform in many ways, but not without its problems, I suppose, in my one-sentence summary, and others will add more sentences, and you've been adding many more sentences through the, the, the course of the day, because it's enshrined something which we've come to see as fundamentally important at that time. And the idea of the secrecy of that is pretty much enshrined around the world. Um, but I observe that um, it's still something we need to fight for. And I mentioned earlier that we have a ballot secrecy bill before Parliament at the moment in order to make sure we do enshrine secrecy of the ballot. So it is still a, an issue that doesn't seem in some quarters to be sufficiently settled. And there are concerns about whether the ballot really is secret. So I think the lessons of history are still, so how is that coming to be? How is it now compared with how it's been in the past? Is it so much dramatically better we shouldn't worry about it or should we continue to worry about this until we are utterly confident of it? Um, and certainly the, the government's motivation around the Elections Act was significantly driven by concerns about electoral fraud, by which they mean people are not respecting the secrecy of the ballot or not feeling confident that their vote will be theirs and it's theirs alone and not taken by someone else in, in some way. Um, so these issues that we're talking about today are very directly relevant. Um, to now in themselves. But they're directly relevant in a much bigger way because many of those Victorian acts are still in force <laughs> and we are still trying to follow them as best we can. Um, and that can be tricky. It's double tricky because it's not just 1870s legislation, it's 1880s, 1890s, 1900s and all the way up to 2022. Uh, we have been accumulating barnacles on this ship of electoral legislation to the extent it is very hard to see any ship whatsoever. And the ability of the ship to stay above the water is becoming more and more difficult. And um, thinking about today, I am redoubled personally in my determination to really fight for a comprehensive review of our canon of law around elections to make it fit to serve the people of the 21st century, but learning the lessons of the people before who have legislated to make successive improvements, because it is hopeless at the moment, and for all the positive things that are in the Elections Act 2022, it has added significantly more barnacles. Um, and that's not just a problem in trying to work your way through the law. It's a problem for voters um, who see things that are un arcane or very, very difficult to understand or appear to be not for them, and new generations of voters want it to be better. It's a problem for candidates and campaigners and parties because um, even the good ones um, who are wanting to follow the law struggle, struggle to do so because there are so many different things they have to comply with and there are completely inconsistent regimes for candidates and for parties because of different barnacles being stuck onto the system at different times without any meaningful reference to each other. Um, and the good candidates come to us for help and we try to give them guidance but the law is the law and they have to follow it and um, if it's complicated they have to get with the programme. But um, but the, the good ones do that. Um, but it's not what they came into politics to do. They came into the campaign for, for whatever issues have motivated them to stand for public office. Not to mind their back all the time because of the risk of being caught out by some obscure rule that um, they don't understand and can't really work out how to... <coughs> um, but of course for the less scrupulous ones, it's a massive opportunity to try and think, well, how do I sail between all of this? join up, so there probably is a gap in the middle if, if we try. And so we're going to run after all that, but it's a problem for the business of politics. And the particular problem that I observe at the moment is, and in fact, I, mean, I started this wrong just over a year ago, and it's only in the last few weeks really I've actually been able to get out and meet people properly because of the, the restrictions we had. But you have different conversations, I think, in the setting. 
with a number of current politicians who have said to me, I'm not going to stand again. It's just too awful. Um, uh, there's other things driving that, but the law is part of it. And the law isn't helping you. It's not framed in a way that encourages people to take up a vocation of public life. Um, and that's a pity. Um, people bemoan the fact we have a narrower, narrower cadre of people who are in office and they come from a particular time. And we kind of scoff at that, but collectively we've done that. We've created the incentives that have led to this. And particularly my role, thinks of what the hell we do. Um, but then share a thought also for um, our poor friends who are at polling stations each May um, trying to understand this, this law. And the kind of secrecy bill has come about because of concerns that um, in some polling places, it's very difficult to ensure secrecy um, because people come in as families and how can you separate necessarily individuals when you come in as a large family in a very small polling place and how do you be confident there isn't one person in that family who is effectively overseeing the votes of the rest of the family. Um, but having seen the efforts that um, attorney officers go to to find polling stations, particularly around here, it's a miracle we have election and they make um, effective uh, the most extraordinarily difficult buildings. I mean, and the other thing that hasn't really struck me in, in my youth, we always used to go to a local school for a polling station, but now local authorities aren't out responsible for most of the schools, the schools just say push off. And so, um, but the law is a significant challenge for returning officers, um, and at the moment they are desperately anxious about the elections at 20. They had their annual conference yesterday, so we've got their words ringing in our ears. Look, help us out here. How on earth are we going to implement compulsory photo photographic identification for all voters in May 2023 on top of everything else that we've got to do? So, the first thought I am um, putting to you is what are the lessons of history that would help us in a substantial and comprehensive um, consolidation? electoral law. We haven't even attempted it since the representation of the people in 1983, and that wasn't great, but it still left so much of this behind. We have a recommendation from the law commissions, um, but it's been very thoughtfully done, um, but I'm interested in bringing the business to history to the So that's my one ask of you. My second ask of you is, beyond the law, there is the practice of elections, and how people actually behave um, either within the law or outside the law or, or just more generally in the face of an election. And this discussion we just had about violence, I think, is very relevant to that. No one's actually legislated to that. There is, a, there is a public mood out there or a public approach towards um, democracy and, and elections that creates a certain dynamic. And we have some nasty things going on at the moment that we need to deal with. And we have some out-of-date things going on that are becoming challenging to them. And I think the nasty thing is going on, and I think it just goes to the earlier reference about misogyny. Um, and I'm taking the actual commission board to Northern Ireland for our meeting next month. And one of the reasons I wanted to go to Northern Ireland for meeting is we're just completing our reports, which we do every May, on the conduct of elections in England, Scotland, um, Northern Ireland and Wales. And um, in Northern Ireland in particular, but also in the other countries of the UK, the level of uh, abuse, particularly that women candidates had to cope with, especially online, was I mean, sickening is probably the only word I can think of, um, and encourages those women, particularly coming, coming forward, I think it was astounding. But why are we not encouraging people to stand? And what should we do about it? There are legal remedies. The online safety bill going through Parliament at the moment is, is potentially one. Um, and these sorts of issues aren't just happening inside the um, election space, they're happening in society anyway, but they are certainly corrupting elections. And um, they slightly aligned to that this whole issue of the kind of fake news and fakery and people founding their, their, their decisions on, on lies. Um, that, when you just look at what's happening in the current hearings on the capital rights in America. And we can't assume things like that won't happen here. So 
how should we act? How should we modernise? How should we think about um, how our system should be beyond just modernising? And in the last few months, we've launched a project on modernising voting and we want to get out in the country and listen to people's views <coughs> on that because people's views are, are very conflicted and interesting when you think about um, uh, think about the value of history. Most people actually quite like voting as it is. They like going to a polling station because we've always gone to a polling station. And there is this golden thread of civic duty that is still quite strong even amongst younger people. Um, but it's less strong about younger people. So what the hell do we do about like that? Why have you got all these electoral registers that don't join up and you've got potentially got people who are registered in several different places that no system for actually checking? Because um, why are you not doing something um, in a more active way about um, the provenance of data? And the Elections Act, to be fair to it, does introduce um, imprints on online material so you can click through and find out who has written this thing. Um, and you're trying to check out whether it's, whether it's correct or not. Um, but my second ask of you, what are the lessons for history as we approach the task of constancy in the terms of bringing our canon of behaviour around elections up to high standards of service and high standards of morality? And with that as a serious reflection on what I draw from the life of our late <coughs> Queen, I'm pleased. I've taken a bit longer than was originally built, but I thought I would, given there's only two of us rather than four, so I hope that's okay. Tremendous. Thank you so much, John. I mean, huge amount to, to think about. Well, Robert. Well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to take part and for the very kind remarks at the start. Um, I should say at the start, I'm an enthusiast for electoral reform. But also, like many historians, I have a kind of magnetic attraction to failure. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at my, <laughs> if you look at my research record, um, it's a kind of litany of doomed and unsuccessful reform movements. So that might be the various doomed reform bills of the 1850s and 1860s, or it might be the campaign for votes for women in the decades when that was an impossible political project, or the history of proportional representation, or the long, long arguments in the 20th century about reform of the House of Lords. So Philip asked if I would talk particularly about the challenges that might be faced by electoral reform. So in the spirit of the pessimism of the intellect, um, I'll just try and pull out a few historical examples. So one problem I think is that electoral reform is not a policy. Electoral reform is a slogan. The slogans matter in politics. But if you want to turn it into a policy, you have to make some very difficult decisions about the kind of reform that you want. And those decisions have a long history of splintering the electoral coalitions on which they are, in theory, based. <coughs> so, for example, in the 1850s and 1860s, you would be hard-pushed to find any serious politician who opposed reform. Every government from 1852 to 1867 committed itself to the reform of parliaments. There were reform bills in 1852, 1854, 1859, 1860, and 1866, all of which sank below the waterline. And some of them sank the governments that tried to carry them as well. Because while they could agree that reform was a wonderful thing, what they couldn't agree on was what kind of reform they wanted. Who did they want to enfranchise? How did they want to do it? And on what terms? And of course, these aren't abstract academic questions. These are questions about the distribution of power, which means that they affect everything else <coughs> that the party might aspire to achieve. The campaign for women's suffrage had a similar problem. It's one thing to persuade people that women in the abstract should be able to vote. It's much harder to agree on which women, married women or single women, propertied women or working women, all women or a particular section. Now, those were questions on which suffragists themselves vehemently disagreed. So it was entirely possible <coughs> to believe passionately and sincerely in votes for women 
while arguing equally passionately and sincerely against the women's suffrage bill that was going through Parliament because it was bringing in the wrong women. As for proportional representation, the closest that Britain has ever come to junking first past the post is in the Representation of the People Act in 1918, when both Houses of Parliament agree that it's got to go. The problem is that one of them wants the alternative vote, and the other wants proportional representation, mm -hmm. and they keep switching the, the appropriate clauses in the bill until eventually they run out of parliamentary time, and the whole thing is just dropped. And I think we're in a similar position today. There is a lot of opposition out there to first pass the post. There is nothing like a consensus on what electoral system might replace it. So if you want to take this slogan, electoral reform, and turn it into a policy, you've got to, first you've got to address some very complicated technical questions, but you've also got to face big questions of political principle about what it is that you're actually trying to achieve. So, do you want to make it easier for minorities to elect members of parliament? Or do you want to stop conservatives from winning in seats where there is a progressive majority, in inverted commas, but it's fractured between different parties? Do you want to weaken the extremes? Or do you want to bring the extremes into the parliamentary system? Do you want to loosen the grip of party machines? Or do you want simply to expand the range of parties? So that's one problem. It's exacerbated by a second one, which is that the peculiarity of Britain's reform history is that each of these famous reform acts was carried by the parliament that superseded. So the Great Reform Act is carried by the unreformed parliaments. Votes for women is carried into law by male legislators. And unless we are planning a revolution, that is going to be the same with electoral reform. Electoral reform is going to have to be carried by MPs who have won power under first past the post. So we have to ask what is going to be in it for them. And we have to ask that especially when there isn't a clear cohort that is shut out of the electoral system and angry about it in the way that you could talk about working people or middle class manufacturers or women who are outside the electoral system insulted by that and demanding entry. Now, historically, the answer to that question of what are you going to gain was often that reform would increase the effectiveness of government. The idea was that if Parliament had a real public opinion behind it, it could do more and it could do it better. The problem is that today, supporters of electoral reform tend to think that government has too much power, that actually government is not too effective, it is too easy for them to carry through whatever major changes they want. So they tend to actually want to make it harder for government to do things. That's a quite difficult case to make for a government potentially coming into office after 13 or 14 years of opposition that has big things that it wants to do and is being asked to blunt, and blunt the tools with which it might be able to do it. Because reform is difficult, it tends to happen under one of two conditions. Either when a failure to reform looks actively dangerous, as it did in 1832, or when reform has, in a sense, become unavoidable, and so it's just holding up everything else that politicians might want to do. So 1918 would be a classic example of the latter. The old registration system had essentially collapsed during the First World War, so you were going to have to have a reform bill if you weren't going to disfranchise everyone who had gone to France to fight. So you needed to clear that out of the way before you could get on with the serious business of post-war reconstruction. And no one really thinks it's a good idea to spend the first two years of peace arguing about franchises and constituency boundaries. So there's a strong push to get reform done, and then you can do post-war reconstruction. Today, I think it's more likely to be argued that electoral reform is a distraction from the cost of living crisis, or from the energy crisis, or the serious business of sending asylum seekers to Rwanda, or destabilizing Northern Ireland, or whatever it is that you, you want your government to be doing. 
So you've got to find a way to persuade people that they will be better governed under a new electoral system, that there will be practical benefits to them from taking a decent chunk of the next parliament to reform how the electoral system works. So those are just a few gloomy points to throw into the conversation about electoral reform. Of course, as we all know, past performance is not a guide to future potential. These are challenges to be navigated. They are not insurmountable or obstacles that, that we can't get across. But if the goal of electoral reform is to succeed, we do, I think, need to be serious about these challenges and about how we turn electoral reform from a slogan into a policy and then into electoral practice, which historians can then pick over at some anniversary <laughs> conference of the IHR at some 50 or 100 years' time. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, right. Um, we're, we're not going to go far beyond six o'clock because we've got drinks waiting upstairs and we can have a, a sort of more convivial sort of uh, conversation. There's a huge amount to think about there. I've got thoughts myself, but I really want to throw it out to the audience. So please, your thoughts on, on what, what John and Robert have just said. Please raise your hand if you'd like to. Martin, you. Um, I, yeah, I could. I, I have something floating in my head. Um, Go ahead. It, it, it's it's really about impact, but I'm not really sure if it's a question or, uh, or even a comment. Um, it, it, mainly about impartiality, um, because the, 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 the both thinking of past reform and wrong, what we've talked about, current reforms um, we've been talking about, is that the electoral reform is. At present, you have the issue of um, how how is how is a future of all really going to retain kind of disinterestedness and in terms of creating a, an electoral system or a political system that's fair in the future. Um, and I just wondered how how the electoral commission at, at, at present time um, seen as kind of how it how it guards against it maintains its impartiality or how it's seen itself as working. Like partial frame it's kind of frameworks for doing so, um, particularly when you have like, the current government and previous government to put through electoral reforms, and I'm talking all the way back through to the 1830s, that are clearly part of the party that can be orientated. Um, no, well, I think it really goes to the heart of the challenge that the current commission has. And, um, it also links with the facts of the way Parliament works, that you have to have a current Parliament that is not impartial because it is dominated by one party who can get things through, who, what's the incentive for them to do something that what's by definition is, is going to be different and therefore in their words worse than what's got, got me, got me. Um, so navigating that is, is tricky. I mean, the, the first thing that Parliament has done that when I was applying for the job, I thought, God, how on earth is this going to work? Um, which is actually, I think, very wise. So the commission itself is constituted of 10 people, um, four of whom must be nominated by political parties. And they should be the three largest political parties in the House of Commons, and one representing all of the others. Now, what that does is it kind of enshrines impartiality in the sense that we have four political voices in the room we never talk about anything. Um, but it also stops us being dominated by a, a group thing that might inadvertently favour one or the other. And that wasn't in the <coughs> original act. It was added later when they saw how the electoral commission was working. And what they saw was an organisation that was perceived to be drifting away from politics because it was worried about independence. And I think what you've highlighted is the real thing that's important is impartiality, which in some ways is, 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 well, it is quite a different idea to independence because it is kind of in the mix of it. But um, I mean, my, my best way of thinking about impartiality in respect of elections, um, which I, I pontificated on in my um, interview, which was 
helpfully live on TV at the time, which added to a bit of pressure. But I, I, I defined impartiality in a very prosaic way in elections. It was around acceptability, acting in a way that promotes um, elections whose outcomes are going to be acceptable. And kind of thinking through that lens, what are the things that might somehow undermine the um, acceptability of an election um, by losing candidate and being driven by by that. So in relation, for example, to voter ID, which is probably the most controversial policy that I've had to really think about in my time here. When the government had it in its manifesto, they are seeking to do it. They've seen it done in other countries, including Northern Ireland. They have seen that international observers say that we are very unusual in not requiring people to give some kind of means of identification of of who they are, and um, they also observe that there is a general underlying um, concern amongst a significant proportion of the public that is my, is my vote safe? So there is a legitimate reason why the government has put forward that policy. But at the same time, there is a legitimate concern in the opposition. This is going to disenfranchise millions of people who don't have photographic ID, <coughs> don't want to have photographic ID, and mm. actually don't believe in the idea of carrying their papers around with mm. them. And which includes the Biden, not under the current government, but, <laughs> um, but there is another line that says, well, photographic ID isn't a good thing. Um, mm. So the policy that the Electoral Commission has taken is to say, but we have an objective here which is about fraud. And photographic ID can help to indicate the fraud and perceptions of fraud. But we also have an objective about accessibility of the vote. And everybody who has the right to vote should not be, um, uh, by this policy, disenfranchised. Now, inevitably, I mean, passage of the bill, it was fascinating that every Conservative member got up and said, well, the Electoral Commission supports our policy of introducing ID cards, and the opposition politicians got up and said, well, the Electoral Commission supports our policy of fighting this pernicious proposal <laughs> of disenfranchised millions of people, and both of them quoted our numbers. Yeah. And uh, in one respect, that's success. But in another respect, it means we can't torn a bit thinly in mm. trying to reconcile that into a coherent position. Mm. <coughs> the impartiality is, the third position which you can describe as, uh, as impartial and coherent. And uh, it's uh, in the case of the other room, isn't she? But I mean, uh, when I was in House of Commons Librarian, she headed the Parliament Constitution Centre, and her, her day job was to produce briefings for parliamentarians that would enable them to do just that. Um, say with authority what the House of Commons Library says on both sides. Um, to give weight to their argument. But actually both sides were looking at the same document. And so that gave the impartial observer um, and historians the opportunity to see a coherent understanding of the issue, even though there was a division on the floor of the house. Robert, do you need to point? Yes, just briefly, I, I think it's a really important question. It, it's a really nutty problem because we're talking here about the fundamental rules of the political game. Mm -hmm. Constitutions are in sense the ecosystem in which a democracy has to live and grow and breathe. And therefore, if there's anything that we want to be regarded as impartial, it must be that. And yet, the mechanism for carrying it requires it to go through a, a, a partisan parliament in which a party of government sees some advantage in, in doing it. So, if we think back to, say, 1884 to 1885, or indeed 1916 to 1918, you get quite an interesting attempt to create a sort of grand bargain between parties mm -hmm. where you say, look, everybody in a sense has things they dislike about the current electoral uh, dispensation. I mean, today, everyone, it seems to me, has a stake in tackling disinformation, um, deep fake technology. <coughs> it's very clear that first past the post works very well for the Conservative Party in Scotland, for example. And whether there's a way in which you can find some sort of grand bargain in which you roll these things together. Now, I, don't, I think the days of doing that by you know, Mr. Gladstone and Lord Salisbury meeting in private, or a speaker's conference, as in 1917, are probably behind us. But I'm quite interested in the way that things like citizens' assemblies have been used. Um, it's, you know, if Ireland can use citizens' assemblies to tackle an issue as complex and fraught as abortion, then at least elements of our constitutional sentiment, it might be interesting to see what we can do, do there as well. So if I were looking for a mechanism, that would be one that I'd be interested in exploring further. Tom, you want to come and then Carol. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you can think about electoral integrity in, in, in various ways. One of that is, is 
in terms of procedural integrity are the rules being followed and so on. Um, but you can also think about this in terms of the democratic integrity of elections. And I think a crucial measure there, surely, is the number of people, or the percentage of people, who actually bother to turn out and vote. Um, I mean, John, you mentioned before about people thinking of the vote as an important civic duty. That is slightly contradicted by the statistics on, 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 on turnout. I mean, crudely, at the local level, there have always been, throughout the 20th century, a bit of a disaster in this country. It's consistently over 50%. Uh, but the problem of, of, of non-voting is also uh, getting worse um, at the parliamentary level, principally since 2001. Um, added to which, as I'm sure John will know, is the problem of non-registration. Now, turnout in this country is the percentage of those who vote, of those who are registered to vote. But there's the growing problem now of non-registration. Most people just don't even feature in the, the turnout figures that are uh, normally published. So, um, I'm just basically after your thoughts on, on, those, on those two problems. The problems of turnout, and then the problems also of non registration in, in, in the first place, and why it is that these problems don't uh, seem to feature uh, loom large in, in, in contemporary discussions of, of, of elections and democracy in this, in this country, and also perhaps what we, what we might do to address those problems. John? You know, I, mean, I, I think what Robert said earlier really goes to the heart of why we don't take this seriously because there's always something more important um, and it isn't enough of a visceral problem for someone to act there isn't a collapse or a disaster that's actually prompting this um, and coupled with that I think there is I think it probably is unique to Britain actually it's not something we're ever taught about or think about as children we don't we don't understand our constitution or our or even our history terribly terribly well. And certainly one of my campaigns when I was in running the education centre in Parliament was just surely we can get more children to do a little bit of citizenship education and parliamentary education. Let's get more of them coming to Parliament because they don't know and therefore there's a significant number of people who don't care. And I mean, for all of the madness of the American system, they do at least know they've got a constitution <laughs> and pledge allegiance to it and there's, there's some kind of basis on which they're connected to it. But what I find frustrating is a kind of thread of apathy in here that coupled with there's no, dis there's no disaster that politicians feel they need to fix, but there's no um, real knowledge or understanding, or no, not sufficient knowledge and understanding amongst enough people to do something. So can, can, I, can I raise a point here? Because it's sort of been on the back of my mind. And, um, and Robert was saying, of course, obviously, every you know, reform is brought about by an unreformed. Parliament. But I mean, in, in 2011, uh, rather than enacting constitutional reform, the government put it out to a referendum, which of course the, 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 the motion for the alternative vote failed. And in you know, the last 11 years, we've seen major issue, we've seen three separate referendums capable of, and in, in one's, one case actually, changing the whole nature of the United Kingdom. And and in a sense the the you know the the Brexit word um, um, Brexit in a way that vote took on a greater legitimacy than Parliament, than the judiciary. Um, and I don't really remember ahead of that that referendum very many prominent people saying, we are representative parliamentary democracy. A, a referendum of that nature is, is anathema to our system. So surely kind of, you know, what is the constitution? What is that constitution that you hope people will respect and treasure? Um, when government seems so you know, so casual about bypassing it through the mechanism of a referendum. But I think in each of those three cases, the imperative 
for reform. We met the conditions that Robert has set out. So, I mean, the AV vote was a condition of the Liberals joining the government yeah. and enabling the government right. to form a government. And uh, we did so the Brexit referendum, really, that yeah. the government felt in order to keep their party quiet, they needed to promise, promise this action. And um, the, the, the Scottish referendum, kind of likewise. So it, there, there wasn't an opportunity not to act, but there was no desire to actually improve particularly. They were pragmatic decisions on a particular issue that become problematic for the people who had been elected. Well, it is interesting, though, if you read the parliamentary debates on the decision to hold a referendum and indeed on the previous votes that pushed Cameron into doing it, there's almost no discussion at all of the constitutional implications of a referendum. Yeah. The, even those who oppose it yeah. say, oh, it's the wrong moment, yeah. or we should be focusing on yeah. something else. Mm -hmm. you know, the intellectual case had vanished. You can see by that stage it begins to do this. Yeah. And I think 2011 and 2016 in some ways offer an interesting contrast of two models of, of referendum-based constitutional reform. Because in 2011, you take a particular model of electoral reform and you put it to the public. And even most advocates of, of electoral reform don't really like AV, so they don't rally behind it. In 2016, on the other hand, you just put the slogan to the country. Mm. You say, would you like Brexit? Yeah. And then afterwards, Parliament has to try and work out what yeah. Brexit means, and that almost broke our parliamentary system. Yeah. You've still got, you know, at some point yeah. in there, you've got to move from the slogan yeah. to the policy. And if you do it before the referendum, that increases your chances of losing this. Yeah. If you do it afterwards, then you almost blow apart your political system. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Caroline was, was waiting. Well, actually, the point that was just been made was the one I was going to make, that somehow electoral reform seems to be about particulars and how it works, mm -hmm. but actually, what I was on the electoral commission more I'd be concerned about was getting more people to vote. I, mean, I think that's trying to get to enlarge the participation of people in our electoral I mean, the referendum the percentage was higher. I mean, yeah. it was because they felt somehow a direct impact, whereas our parliamentary system is a kind of you vote for your MP, you vote for something, you know, it seems more remote. I don't know. Do you consider how to enlarge the participation? I mean, there's, there's quite an interesting nuance there that I'm still, to be honest, getting my head around. Yeah. So it is certainly our business to increase the number of people registered to vote because that is um, a, a, unless you've got that you don't have the opportunity and there is a right there that people are not giving themselves the chance to exercise but when it comes to voting itself I think the, the tradition has, has been which I think is, is right that you need to have people that individuals want to vote for and so typically the uh, emphasis on getting out the vote has been something for the parties rather than for the commission itself. And they jealously protect that right. And so in the uh, legislation around the electoral commission, a lot of our, uh, our role is, is not cast in that way for that reason that this is, um, if, if the Proportion voting is going up and down. That is a measure of um, the attractiveness of the offer um, by the parties. And I, I think that is quite a respectable position. I think it's, it's challenged with things like voter ID, but I think it absolutely is the business of the Electoral Commission to make it um, possible and certainly easy, ideally easy and certainly possible for everybody who has, has the right to vote to vote. Um, but that's actually a little bit different to have, making an objective to drive out upturning. So unless you have compulsory voting, I think the proportion of people who are not voting is itself a very interesting indicator of the success of the political system. Tom, you wanted to come? Yeah, thank you. And with apologies for a very specific question, but it directly follows on from that fascinating point. Yeah. There is the get out the vote responsibility of parties in our system. But that is hampered by things outside of its control. For example, we talked earlier about the day an election is held. Like in among party activists of all the main parties, there is the what's known as the East Enders factor, right? People go to vote just after East Enders, right? Um, that means that these things, like what day it's held, have a direct relevance to things like turnout. So if we've held on a weekend, 
that might affect turnouts and that might be the responsibility of the commission rather than the party because the party has no control of that. Yeah, and we do do evaluations of pilots on that. So, for example, in the May elections of this year, um, we did four different pilots in Wales to test whether different days or different locations. So, um, since they've been increased the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds, having public stations inside FE colleges while the students were, mm -hmm. were there. Um, so we have done those. In fact, in the last few weeks, we've published the results of those those pilots, so that we can look at whether those kinds of reforms are actually effective. Um, and we certainly looked at turnout and, and take up of those options. It was very small, okay. but it does give us some um, information to go on, and we are very keen to do that. And um, typically, you, you're looking for volunteer local authorities to run a pilot, and our job is then to evaluate that, to look at the evidence, and then to create a debate and say, well, surely we shouldn't be doing this um, on Thursdays all the time when people might prefer it to be a Sunday or whatever it is. So that absolutely is our job. But it's different to the point that was being made that surely we should worry about turnout in itself and the electric commission therefore should take the responsibility to do something about it. I'm less convinced by that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly we should provide the evidence base so there is a proper debate and that actually some people are um, missing out because of that which is to have elections on the first day between these hours. Yes, thank you. Um, please. Um, John, you asked us at the beginning what history might teach us. Has history taught us that royal commissions are now not possible or useful? Well, I... Well, I, well, I, well, I hope not, but I, this, this concept of a grand bargain feels to me the right thing to include the mechanism by which you bring electoral reform is at least as important as what the reform is, so that you have some confidence something can happen. And royal commissions have done that in the past, um, but are out of favour at the moment. I mean, I guess the, the modern day equivalent is conditions of inquiry on COVID, for example, and other things that are, are happening, where the expectation is that some process that is separate from politics will look from a little bit of distance at what has happened and what we should learn from it and therefore what we should do about it. Um, and I think we should be looking for something like that. And I absolutely agree with Robert about Ireland. The way Ireland has used um, citizens' assemblies around um, abortion and on gay marriage, I think it's been fabulous. Um, and absolutely I want, I want to do that. And certainly I've been talking to, to my own team about looking at ideas for modernising elections to create a system of something quite structure that would bring people into a room and that would be another evidence base that um, would encourage or dare I say shame politicians to taking this kind of view that actually there is a, a broad desire amongst the population to do this amongst your supporters and other supporters so come on get on and do it um, but your, your history of doom doesn't yeah. suggest I should get too yeah. hopeful, and I'm not. <laughs> but I'm, I'm determined, but not hopeful, I suppose. Mm. I mean, just, just to flip back to the point about turnout, I, I actually think, I don't want to be too cleanly this evening, but I think we should be terrified about turnout. Particularly because it's not just about the headline figure, it's about generational changes in turnout and the absolutely catastrophic level of electoral turnout among the young. And you know, a democracy can do without many things, but it really can't do without voters. And I don't think we can just leave this to the parties, because parties actually don't have an interest in maximising turnout. They have an interest in winning. And if you can win on a low turnout, you know, there is no particular reason why the Conservative Party at the moment should be encouraging young people to vote. Um, the Labour Party won a landslide in 2001 on an appallingly low turnout election. So I think this is a civic culture problem, not a party problem. Um, and it's something you know, that, that our democracy as a whole needs to be engaging in. And what, of course, one problem here is that, in some ways, the kind of voting that we do at general elections has become very unusual. Elections used to be nested in a whole kind of civic culture that looked a bit like parliamentary elections, where you belonged to all sorts of voluntary associations, you voted for representatives, you might vote for your trade union, or your rotary club, or your mother's union, or your PCC, or whatever it was. You, this was an activity you did in lots of different kinds of arenas. The voting that most people do nowadays is sort of, you know, for the X Factor or whatever, it's an instant hit voting. 
it's you vote and there's an immediate response. This sort of voting once every five years to contribute to a small share of a parliament that makes decisions is quite an odd activity culturally now. So I think there's a cultural problem that we have to engage with. Can I just say, it's also, of course, that you get a larger turnout when you have a single issue, mm. uh, whether it's the Irish ones or whether it's the referendum. It's the, the sort of bundling all the issues together into, into parties is, is not very attractive. Yeah. But is it more effective? The attractive to have a Swiss referendum model where we have votes on single issues all the time. It's, uh, it's, uh, and it's, it's Churchill, this is the worst form of any way of governing anything apart from all the others. And I'm trying to yeah. work out whether we would have unintended consequences at a particular time of reform. Well, I mean, we've been talking about traditions, and the school has a tradition of ending its lives with a drinks reception, which I think is a, is a fine one and well worth upholding. Before we, before we, yes, it could raise both turn out. Before we reconvene in the common room upstairs, um, let, let me thank uh, John and, and Robert for. Um, really thought-provoking and thoughtful remarks and it's been so wonderful and thank, thank you all for uh, turning out in a very a very unusual week um, but I think that we you know we're, we're grateful tremendously grateful for Sir John and Sir John King for um, for sponsoring this event but really suggesting that we, we do something with the history of Parliament it's a reminder that we have so much expertise in, in central London. I think and it, it's wonderful to have not just um, Paul, his colleagues from the History of Parliament, also representatives from the Mile End Group. Um, and I think you know the, the Institute of Historical Research should be you know part of these networks, um, making contacts, exploiting the synergies with these, these groups and history of, and history of policy doing that in, in particular. So thank you all so much uh, for a wonderful day and uh, let's uh, let's we come in upstairs but before we do just thank our panelists very much.